All right, welcome back to the basement. In this episode, we're gonna continue the process in which I followed to build this very first custom base down here in the basement. All right, so I'm finishing marking out the fret slots right here, getting ready to cut them. But before I do, I'm going to take an X-Acto blade and uh, scribe in those pencil lines. Once I get all those scribed in, I go back over and just darken them up with a really fine .03 lead pencil. And then uh, get my little fret saw. And I mask it off as a depth gauge and I cut in the fret slots. Later on you'll see, I wish I had a miter box for this particular job. But at this stage, they're all straight. All right, now I'm prepping the headstock. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to thickness it down. This is kind of a stressful cut. Uh, once I get that done on the bandsaw, then I start cleaning up on the oscillating spindle sander slash oscillating belt sander. Does a really good job of getting in that transition from the top of the neck to the, to the headstock. And then I start cleaning it up with the leveling beam. And you'll notice that the transition from the fretboard to the headstock is really, really great. Um, I was toying with the idea of trying to cut in a break angle to the headstock and I just opted to go flat, but have it be a farther distance to get the strings to break at a steeper angle, but without having to do like a scarf joint or something like that. All right. So two things, this hole not being centered on the neck is going to drive me nuts long term. So I'm going to have to fix it. I'm going to do this in one of two ways. I'm going to also fix this because I want this transition to come all the way up into the fretboard. Since I cut the fretboard too short, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a small piece of sapili and instead of trying to use a scrap of the fretboard and make it match, what I'm going to instead do is I'm going to take a piece of sapili, I'm going to straighten off this line with the file because I accidentally nicked it with the sander a couple of times. So I'm going to bring this back probably just about to here. So it's a, maybe an eighth inch long or wide rather. And I'm going to veneer on a piece of sapili. I'm going to fix that transition curve. Then I'm going to put a veneer over this made out of a piece of the body because I want it to stain it to match. And if I went too thin on the sander, this will give me an opportunity to correct that and bring the thickness back up just a hair. Um, but what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and bend it to match this curve and meet all the way up at the fretboard or at least up to that piece of sapelia that I'm getting ready to put in. And then I'm going to cut one plug just to fill that hole. And then when, after I veneer it, I'm gonna re-poke the hole through the plug. I mean, I still have perfect access to the truss rod. It's not quite, quite centered, but it's gonna bother me that it's not. So I'm gonna fix that. So I'll perfectly center it after I plug this. So a piece of Speely, Speely plug. And then once I get that done, I will cover this in a veneer come all the way up to here, hopefully, or at least cover the sapili. And then what I'll do is I'll poke a new hole that's centered. So that's the plan. I'm gonna plug the hole, extend the fretboard back out, veneer it, redrill the hole centered. So let's get after it. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm just getting ready to plug that hole and cut out a piece of sapili to actually kind of fill in that gap between the maple veneer and the headboard 
or <clears throat> between the uh, the fretboard and the maple veneer that I'm going to apply to the top of the headstock. But first, I flatten out that transition with some rasps and some chisels and files, just making sure it's perfectly smooth and flat before I start trying to attach um, this piece of sapili, which for some reason I decide to put in first and notch out around the hole and then plug the hole after all that is done. So it's kind of a convoluted way to do it, but it ends up working. And to make that dowel plug, to plug the hole, I just chucked up a piece of scrap sapili in the drill and kind of made a dowel that way. So now that it's plugged, and then I got that transition piece there, there's no real way to clamp it, so I decided to just tape it up. And now for something completely different. Trying to find a piece of wood to from the same slab that I did the body out of to make that headstock veneer. So I'm tracing out body blanks on there just so I don't cut into a piece of wood that I need in order to make a guitar body later. So I find a little chunk, cut it out. So I plane one side flat so that I can run it through the bandsaw. Um, and I cut it really, really thick. So I start thinning it down with some hand planes. And then I start getting the final thickness with the belt sander. I'm just using a little scrap piece of wood clamped to the workbench to op act as a stop so that uh, the sander doesn't like shoot it into my stomach. I'm just trying to get this thin enough so that it's flexible once I get it wet with hot water. I didn't film me actually setting up the bending jig, um, but essentially what I'm doing here is just uh, getting the headstock prepped to accept the veneer so I'm cutting off the excess from the previous the plug and the scrap piece that I put in place and then I'm going to smooth out that transition in preparation to, for the veneer. And Here's the final product. It actually turned out really really well. And it's going to be even better once it's covered up with the veneer. All right, this is the next evening. We'll see how my vent veneer did. crack on the bottom and it's in a spot that I'm going to cut off anyway so for a test that I had low hopes on meaning I thought I was going to have to do this more than one time to get right I'm actually kind of impressed let's see how it fits dude that's good enough with a clamping call to actually put on no freaking way. Very cool. There's gappage for sure. So I made this clamping call while that wood was drying. I want to get this flat because I'm afraid it's going to potentially emboss it. 
I'm sure I'll be able to sand it out, but that's uh, my scrap wood clamping call. So I'm gonna get some clamps on it, see what it looks like, and then kind of go from there. All right, so now I'm just doing a test clamp dry before I start applying glue. And the way I bent that piece of wood is I just soaked the one end that needed to get bent in hot water and got it good and pliable. And then I set it up in the same jig that I'm clamping it to the uh, headstock with, which is just a scrap piece of wood with a, a curve in it that matches the radius of the headstock. Now the hardest part about this is you can't really clamp it to pull the that piece of scrap wood in toward that curve, but somehow I just got lucky here because it turned out pretty okay. All right, so I took these out. It's been about four days, four or five days for the most part took these out of the cactus juice and I went ahead and baked them at 200 degrees for two and a half hours. So they are still a little brittle, but they're certainly harder and more dense than before. So I got to say for what I'm using this for, being that these will be pick guards and inlay material, I think I'm going to be okay. So the problem is, is these guys developed some cracks. And this one's pretty bad and I got to try and fix it before it completely gets hard or loses all flexibility and I don't know if I can do that. So this is probably going to involve some flooding of CA glue. All right, so I'm just scraping off some excess cactus juice uh, that bubbled up during the baking process, and then I'm filling all the big cracks and crevices with CA glue. Uh, I don't know why I'm going bananas here. I'm really just trying to get these cracks joined. Because um, when I go to thickness this wood down, I don't want the I don't want it to break. So I'm just planing out the joined edges that are going to need to be made. And then I contemplate, well, how am I going to thickness this thing down? And is it big enough to do the design that I'm thinking I'm going to do? All right, now I sand off all of the crazy pencil marks I have so I can get a clean slate. And I opt to just freehand the entire thing. And just to give my head some representation of what it might look like finished, start marking out where I would put the knobs, make sure they are in a good spot ergonomically. Again, just double checking that this pick guard blank would fit. All right, so I think this is the play. I'm gonna marinate on this for a little bit. I think before I start notching out a control cavity, I'm just gonna work on the pick guard blank. I think this is a more unique design than my original plan to follow the horn. I don't wanna cover up too much of the wood. This covers up the least. I kinda of like this. All right, so here I'm kinda of getting an idea of where the control cavity is going to be on the backside, uh, cause this is not gonna be a control cavity that's routed in from the front of the guitar body under the pick guard. 
And I'm just trying to figure out how to thickness thing, this thing down. While I do that, I break a piece off, glue it back on, and I quickly realize I don't like how that works. Okay, so I'm gonna take a break from this pit guard material because that does not seem to be the best use of my time. Um, man, this cactus juice really made this stuff hard. Um, it still has brittleness to it, so it's not like it made it super strong, but I think it's made it good enough to use for what I want to use it for. So I'm considering using some of the smaller pieces for block inlays for the fretboard, and then pit guard. I've changed the design to something like this. I think it would look kind of cool. Um, show it on the body. This is kind of what I'm thinking. It covers less of the body wood, which is kind of what I was, kind of what I wanted to do. So rather than follow the outline of the horn, like a, I don't know, like an older P base or something. But anyway, it's time to take this veneer out of the clamps and see what we've got. I'm really cautiously optimistic that this worked first try. If it did, that'll be amazing. It's not perfect. There's a little bit of gap around the curve. But I'm confident I can at least, well, let's see. Gosh, that may not be passable. I may have a solve for this. Let's just keep pressing on. veneer I'm going to wreck the headstock so I cannot have a saw tear cracks like this in the veneer so I'm going to switch over to files and such so in hindsight that saw blade was definitely too aggressive for the task I was using it for and I paid the price, but it was easily repaired. And then I just decided to get in real close, just using sandpaper files and stuff like that. What I've noticed throughout this particular build is just the inevitability of making mistakes. And in the process of making mistakes, you learn creative solutions on how to repair those mistakes and make them invisible. And in some case, make new cool design features out of it. And uh, here's another mistake here, because I chip out a piece of the veneer at the top of the truss rod access hole. So I have to do another repair. Um, that piece of wood, I blew it out, so it wasn't really easily repairable. So fortunately, I kept my scraps from the offcuts and found a piece of wood that matched the grain and uh, patched it with some CA glue and then just instead of drilling out that little overlap um, I just filed it in. And I decided to oversize this truss rod access hole because the worst thing that could happen would be that in the process of making a truss rod adjustment if it's too low um, you don't have clean access, you're going to dent the headstock and that's not what I'm about. All right, so finally I get smart with how to thickness down this pit guard blank and the block inlays. So I bust out my router sled and I put the uh, 
pickguard blanks super or not super glued but hot glued down to a piece of MDF so it's perfectly flat a flat in one side flip it over re-hot glue it and start bringing it down to final thickness with a couple more passes and as you can see it's fairly brittle and I had to make several repairs um, for breaking pieces off but all of them seem to be invisible And then I just do the same thing with these offcuts that um, the block inlays are going to come from. Now with these, I only flatten the one side because that's the side that's going to get glued down to the fretboard. I'm not worried about the other side because I have to sand in a radius and I'll just thickness it down and then sand in the radius. So I don't need to do that extra step here. So now I finally join the two pieces of the pit guard to make a solid blank. And I use this slab of marble as a weight to keep it flat as it dries. All right, let's see how this turned out. I'm mostly interested in how strong this glue joint is with the stabilized wood. I think it'll be okay for a pit guard. I'll probably cut it like this. And I'll do that on the scroll saw most likely. I'll go back and fill cracks and gaps with epoxy. I'll be left honestly with enough material out of this probably to make my inlays and I may not need, even need to touch these. So these can be for two other guitars. Uh, I gotta put the block inlays into the neck before I do anything else. The reason why is because I want to be able to sand the radius into the block inlays as well as the fretboard at the same time. So uh, this will be the first time I've ever done so with block inlays that I've had to cut myself and I've never done it before without frets already in the guitar. Um, which is the right way to do it, uh, but I've never done a scratch build, obviously. So this will my be my first time actually sanding in and not having to file in the radius to the block inlay. So it'll be actually, hopefully much, much easier. But I have to determine the size of these block inlays. I have to cut them out. I know I'm gonna have plenty of extra material after I cut this out. I've got a bunch of material I've already prepped. So I think I'm just gonna go with the material I've already prepped and use those as my test pieces rather than potentially screw some things up. So having said that, I'm going to put this pit guard blank off to the side. I am going to do a test with some shellac as sanding sealer on one of these but I got to sand it up to the grit that I think I'm going to use first. So I'm going to use this, the least interesting one that I've got, which is probably going to be one of these two. So, so the idea is I flattened one side. I didn't flatten the other um, because, well, it's going to be radiused in. So I figured I would just stick the flat side down and then go from there. All right. I've kind of sanded this to a not perfect 220 grit. Feels good in the hand. So this, I guess I'm kind of hoping it doesn't turn this color. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be horrible if it did. Anyway, let's let this naphtha dry. Then I'm gonna hit it with this stuff. So it says to apply two coats as a sanding sealer. 
some three coats if we're going to use this as a finish. But wow, naphtha typically dries really quickly. That's not happening in this case. Which tells me this definitely needs a sealer. Well, the naphtha is off gassing. I'm gonna start figuring out my layout lines for these inlays. All right, so I start just marking out where I wanna draw in these block inlays. And uh, yeah. Just laying out the block inlays at this point. All right, so I've got my layout lines on the neck. So now I can measure, you know, the size of the block inlays. I'm going to trace the block inlays once I get them cut out and match the inlay holes specifically to that. So I've got my test piece of my inlay material. I've got my neck test piece the fretboard rather and I've got a body test piece I want to see what this shellac does to all of it so quick little rub down with the naphtha I sanded these all both of these two pieces with the power sander to a 220 grit finish. This is kind of a cool color. I'm really starting to think, yeah, I, I, my initial imp my initial thoughts were right. This is just a really pale cherry. There's definitely, I've never seen maple with this much red in it. And this thing, man, once you get the, uh, anything rubbed on this the flame just pops out of nowhere there's so much curl in this i can't wait to see the body under finish Tell you what, I'm pleasantly surprised with this fretboard material. This cherry is pretty. Not a whole lot of curl going on, but it's all right. That's why we got this crazy stuff. A lot of this has a lot of curl in it. This spalted pecan. All right. Those are my test pieces. <clears throat> All right, so it's the next day. I've put two more coats of shellac on these test pieces, and I feel like the color is gonna be fine. Like that doesn't bother me. And then that next to the blue, I think this three color combo is gonna look fantastic. So I am going to continue testing my final finish. I'm thinking, um, obviously the shellac is a sanding sealer. I want to see after I bring this down to a 220 after these four coats of shellac, um, will the body would take the stain, the blue stain properly. And if so, then that'll be the process. Otherwise I'll go stain first and then finish over the stain, which is what I'm more comfortable doing, but I want to try it. So, <clears throat> That's where I'm at. I'll let this cure for another hour or so and uh, then do the sand back and see where, see where we're at. Um, so now I think it was time to start cutting the block inlays. So that's what I'm gonna work on now. It's gonna be a little, bit of a tedious process. So let me get after it. All right, so now I'm trying to size up these these block inlays to the layout lines that I just made. So I start by uh, straightening one side and then I get another side square to it so that I've got basically a 
blank piece with at least one right angle, perfectly right angle in it. And I just kind of flatten things out with the leveling beam and make sure everything's nice and perfectly flat and straight for that one right angle. Then once I do that, I take it over to the fretboard and kind of use my layout lines to mark out the, the actual final length and width. And I just kind of repeat the process, making sure that I'm cutting perfectly right angles. So yeah, just start off by making one right angle, line it up in the corner, then marking out where the next two cuts need to go. And that's basically rinse and repeat. All right, so here's where I'm at so far. Got all but four of them cut. I think I found a pretty decent process. All right, so now it's time to use the actual inlays that I just cut to scribe uh, in where I'm actually going to route out the cavities to accept these block inlays. So just in case there's any deviation in size from making the inlays, I want the hole to match the inlay rather than trying to match the inlay to the hole. And then I just use the router attachment on my Dremel tool. And I think there's only one end mill router bit that they make for the Dremel tool. It's a quarter inch. So I can get, you know, all but one of the holes pretty much mostly knocked out with just that one router bit. And this one, as you'll see, it's kind of dull because at some point I'm sure you'll see smoke in the shot. Now, the thinner ones are much, much more high risk. But fortunately, I didn't have any slips. And I just left the final block inlay uh, to be chiseled by hand because the router bit's too wide to actually do the job. So now I just clean up the edges with uh, chisels and get them good to go for the block inlays. All right, I don't want to pound that in because that's good and tight. I'm going to sharpen my big chisel and uh, do some more and check back. All right, I've got four cut out. So I am going to start boxing a couple of these in. All right, so I'm just going to start with the first four block inlays here, just mixing up some 30 minute epoxy and smacking them down I like epoxy because you can fill gaps pretty well with it. Uh, but these are pretty, these are pretty solid fits. So I do clamp them down overnight and um, then I move on to the last bit. Uh, but first, I've got to cut that final block inlay with just hand chisels. So I picked up this little eighth inch Irwin Marples chisel, which does the job really, really nicely. So just more edge cleanup and chiseling. Lots of back and forth because you're sizing all these inlays by hand, both the cavity that you're inlaying it to, as well as you know making adjustments where or when to adjust the inlay itself. And then I go back and do all the same stuff I did before, putting down epoxy and pounding them in.
And just as I did the first time, I clamp them all down and just leave them overnight. All right, all the inlays are in. Super stoked about that. It's a big step. I'm hoping I didn't cut them or set the inlay too thin. Um, it's thicker than a traditional mother of pearl block inlay. It's about, I don't know, the thickness of maybe a pick guard. So I'm not terribly worried, but it could be a problem. So we'll just have to, we'll just kind of have to see how it goes. But anyway, um, yeah, good times. I'm going to get back after this tomorrow evening and uh, start sanding the radius into this fretboard. I may have to level this, these uh, inlays off, get them down to the same, same level as the rest of the fretboard before I start breaking out the radius block. But uh, yeah, we'll figure out how I do that tomorrow. All right, it's the next morning. I can't help myself, I wanna see it. Can't work on it right now. Because right after I unclamp this, I have to go to work. But I wanna see what this thing looks like with all the inlays glued in. And I've already started taking these down with the Shinto rasp and the sanding block or leveling beam, I should say. And I think that's what how I'm gonna bring these down to level or close to it within a half a mil. It's gonna look even better once I get them all leveled down and start getting finish on it. But um, obviously we gotta put the radius in the fretboard first, so. Very cool, very happy. All right, so obviously all these inlays are very much proud of the fretboard, so I take the Shinto saw rasp and I file them down. Now that I got them pretty close to flush, I break out my radius blocks, my sanding blocks to start sanding in the radius. And man, this is a long process to do by hand. Um, but you just got to know that going in. So use a real coarse grit to start off with. And as you get the radius in, then you can start working up the grits. Quite obviously, this is a lot of sanding to sand this radius in by hand with the sanding blocks. So you know, I just start off with a coarse grit, get the radius sanded in roughly. And I'm using pencils to just kind of check and make sure I'm getting consistent sanding across the entirety of the fretboard. And this is why I didn't carve the neck first. But I worked my way up to, I think, 320 grit. And this is where things start going downhill. Because I'm just using the existing kerfs from the first attempt at cutting the fret slots and I'm going fast and I'm not being careful. And I end up with this. These two are crooked. They're slanting that way. It's definitely a problem. Stay tuned for the next episode where I try to figure out how to fix it. All right, I know that was a super long episode and it kind of ended with a, I got a problem to fix kind of situation. Uh, so rest assured, we will address that problem and how I went about trying to fix it in the next episode. So thank you again so much for watching. Join me next time down here in the basement.